Hi, I'm Jonathan Burke, Professor of Finance at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University. And I'm Jules van Binsbergen, a finance professor at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. And this is the All Else Equal podcast. Welcome back, everybody. Before we get started today, I just wanted to make a call out to our listeners and thank them for listening, especially the listeners who subscribed. It's really amazing to see how many subscribers there are, and it's really motivating in terms of what we're doing here. Today, we're going to talk about corporate bankruptcy. And the all else equal mistake that we're going to talk about is the assumption that the act of declaring bankruptcy itself is precipitating the end of the firm. That is, the bankruptcy decision itself is consequent in ending the firm's existence. And I think that's a pretty common assumption, Jonathan. Usually when we see that a firm declares bankruptcy, people think, oh, that's the end of it. Yeah, as a seemingly obvious as this assumption is, it's a mistake. Okay, so let's think about that. There are two reasons a firm would enter bankruptcy. One reason is the underlying business is failing. And so I think that happens when the cost of continuing the business is higher than what it actually brings in in revenues. Exactly. Or alternatively, underlying business is perfectly fine, but the firm just has too much debt. So one example that I think is interesting to discuss here is Hertz, right? So Hertz during the COVID crisis had a pretty rough time. And at some point they decided to declare bankruptcy. And then 12 months later, suddenly Hertz has emerged out of bankruptcy. So I think that is a clear indication that if we have to choose between the two reasons for bankruptcy, one was the business is failing. The other one was they just had too much debt and they had to somehow reorganize that. I think the second is the more plausible explanation. Well, but the other thing to remember is even during the bankruptcy, you could still rent Hertz cars. In fact, from a consumer's perspective, they didn't even know about the bankruptcy. Hertz looked just like Avis. Why don't we talk about how bankruptcy came to be? You know, originally, when you didn't pay your debts back, they put you in prison. And as a society realized, there were some moral issues with that. And so we came up with bankruptcy law, which essentially was a way for debtors to collect as much as they could. And obviously, you can't put a corporation in prison. So in that sense, corporate bankruptcy is just an orderly process for the debtors to collect as much as they can. They're obviously not going to get fully paid back. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a bankruptcy, but they're going to get as much as they can. And so the debt holders have a very clear choice to make. Whenever a firm is declaring bankruptcy, given the fact that the debt holders want to get back as much as they can, how will they get back as much as they can? On the one hand, they can say, let's just sell off every piece of property that Hertz has. Let's sell off all the cars. Let's sell off all the real estate. And let's see how much money we can recoup that way. The alternative for the debt holders is to say, you know what? actually Hertz is worth more to us by just continuing operating it and try to recoup as much money as we can that way. Right. So really what bankruptcy is in a corporate situation is simply a change of control. Before the bankruptcy, the equity holders controlled the firm or the shareholders controlled the firm. After the bankruptcy, the shareholders get nothing and the debt holders get all the assets, so they take control of the firm, and they make decisions, continue operations, or shut the firm down. But the debt holders will make that decision. So anybody who has led money to the firm gets control of the firm. So the really insightful thing to realize is all a corporate bankruptcy is, is a change of control. So now let's generalize this a bit and just think about two identical firms. The firms operate exactly the same type of business. They sell the same products. They have the same employees. Everything is the same. The only thing that's different between these two firms is how much debt they have. Now, the question is, is the decision to continue operating the business, is that in any way dependent on how much debt we have? Okay. Let's assume that the firm with debt declares bankruptcy, but assume the firm is healthy. What's going to happen? Well, in that case, if the business model's fine and it's more profitable to continue operating the firm compared to shutting it down, you'll just continue. Now, the all equity firm obviously can't declare bankruptcy because there's no debt in that firm, but it's identical. It will also continue operating. So both firms will continue operating. Okay, let's take the alternative. So now we're looking at a firm where the cost of continuing operation is higher than the revenue it brings in. So from a business decision making point of view, the better decision is to shut down the firm. So when the debt holders take possession of the firm, 
What are they going to do? They're going to liquidate the firm. But obviously, the same must be true of the all-equity firm. It's not a good business decision of that firm to keep operating. We just said, you're better off shutting it down than keep operating. So the equity holders in that firm will also shut it down. And so yet again, both firms make the same decision. So we've just proven the point where we started off the discussion. And that is the act of declaring bankruptcy itself has no impact on the question of whether it's a good business decision to keep the firm operating or not. So now the question is, can we generalize this argument? If the way that the firm is financed with debt and equity and in what ratio doesn't matter for this important business decision, does it matter for any other business decision that we're making inside the firm? And the answer is no, it doesn't matter using the same intuition. Financial economists call this the Modigliani-Miller proposition, named after Modigliani and Miller, who won the Nobel Prize for pointing it out. Ironically, they were not the first people to derive it. The first person to have this important insight was John Burr Williams. And I think the Nobel Prize Committee erred in not giving the Nobel Prize to John Burr Williams when they gave it to Bendigliani Miller. Isn't there, isn't there some funny joke about this, about propositions? Yes, you know, my good friend Mark Rubenstein used to say, if a proposition is named after somebody, it almost certainly means they were not the first people to derive it. So let's use John Burr Williams' argument to understand it better. The way that he went about it was as follows. He said, suppose that there's only one person who owns both the equity and the debt of the firm. Now, what could it possibly matter for the business decision how to proceed in what ratio that person holds both those pieces? In other words, it's just relabeling. That person has all the cash flows the firm generates. So you can label one as debt and equity, but the total cash flows are the same. And so that person isn't going to care. And that's how John Burr Williams derived the very important insight that how the firm finances itself doesn't affect the underlying business model of the firm. And so there is a very important all else equal mistake that follows from this wrong way of thinking about the debt equity ratio. And that is that Many people, often bankers, claim that you should always finance your firm with debt because they say debt is cheaper because you can get it at a lower rate than having to entice equity holders to invest with you. And for that reason, you should always finance your firm with debt. And that's an all else equal mistake because what it's ignoring is the reason debt has a lower return is because it's less risky. Equity is more risky than debt and has a higher return. It's no cheaper. It's just your investors are taking on different risks. And in fact, if as a firm you take on more debt, you are actually making the equity riskier because you will have to pay the debt holders back first before the equity holders get anything. Exactly. The equity of an all-equity firm is less risky than the equity of a firm with debt. But the overall riskiness of the firm is the same. And Burr Williams said it. Look, if I have an all equity firm, that's going to have a certain level of risk. If I'm the single uh, investor in that firm, or if I have a firm with debt and equity, certainly my debt and equity is going to have different risk, but I'm getting the same cash flows. So my overall risk is the same as it is for the all equity firm. And now finally, let's circle back to the very beginning of our discussion. In making the mistake of equating bankruptcy with liquidation, people often make the mistake of subsidizing firms when there's no reason for it. We've heard a lot about when firms get in trouble, we need to bail them out. But let's think a little carefully about what that bailing out actually implies. Well, when would be a situation where you'd bail out a firm? Because as we've discussed, if the firm is a good firm to operate, the debt holders will keep operating it. So there's no reason to bail it out. So the only time you have to bail it out is if the firm doesn't make sense to operate. And normally when we say we have firms that don't make sense to operate, the optimal thing is to shut them down. The only condition under which you wouldn't want to shut the firm down is there's some externality for the firm operating. So for example, there could be suppliers of the firm or other parties that are connected to the firm. In the case of General Motors, I think this argument was made quite forcibly that you know too many people depended on General Motors that we couldn't let it fail and the externalities were large enough. But the problem of course, Jules, is if I am the debt holder, I would like the subsidies. I could easily argue that I'm going to shut the firm down if the subsidy didn't exist. 
knowing full well that in fact, that wouldn't be my case. So we have to be very careful when debt holders announce or threaten to shut the firm down. We have to actually make sure that that's what they're going to do. Yeah, because anybody likes to receive a subsidy if you can. So Jonathan, one last thing to discuss then though is when you look at the surveys of CFOs and you ask CFOs, what is the most important part of your job? They do indicate that how much debt and equity financing they should use is at the top of that list. So what are we missing? Well, I think this, what we talked about here was pretty simplistic and that in the real world, the decisions are more complicated. Uh, you know, we spoke about one friction already, which is the externalities, right? The firms can have externalities, but there are other frictions because obviously bankruptcy is a costly process. You have to hire lawyers. And the other thing about bankruptcy is contracts don't survive. So not just the debt contract. You could have other contracts in the firm that don't survive bankruptcy. So it could be difficult to write contracts if the firm has a lot of debt because the person on the other side of the contract anticipates that there's a chance of bankruptcy and his contract might not be uh, honored. Like a labor contract. Exactly. Where's a good example of a labor contract? So workers in firms with a lot of debt might worry that a labor contract that says they can't be fired would be violated in the case of bankruptcy. And then there's another very important friction, and that friction is, and we've discussed this friction before, financing with debt has a benefit because interest payments are tax deductible, because your tax bill is computed on the after interest payment profits, not the before interest payment profits. And so by financing your firm more with debt, you can keep more of the money for the stakeholders in the firm and not give it to the government. And that increases the value of the firm, but also sometimes we call the tax shield. And you know, that is one of my big concerns about how we tax. What effectively the government's doing is encouraging firms to hold more debt. If the firm has more debt, it's harder to write long-term contracts. So it's harder for the employees to write a contract with the firm that gives them job security. Now, job security is a pretty useful thing. We're moving risk from the employee to the firm, which is the optimal thing to do. So making that contract harder to write makes employees harder to hire and it's overall bad, I think, for the economy as a whole because having that insurance is good for everybody. Agreed. So let's summarize. We started off with, in a world without these frictions that we discussed at the end, the trade-off between how much debt and equity you should hold is pretty much, there's, there isn't much there. It, it doesn't really matter how you finance yourself, whether it's with equity or debt. And we illustrated this with a very simple decision to make, which was the decision to continue operating or not. And we concluded that for that business decision, it didn't matter how you finance yourself and came then generalized that and came to the conclusion that for any business decision in this frictionless world, it wouldn't matter how you finance yourself. But to make it more nuanced at the end, I do think we need to include these frictions in the discussion. How important are these frictions? How important are these labor contracts? How valuable is the fact that debt is tax deductible? How costly is the bankruptcy process for everybody involved? That's a very important insight, Jules. In other words, it is important when people claim that the level of debt matters, that they also explain what friction is causing it to matter. If they don't explain what friction is causing to matter, I'm highly suspicious that in fact, they want to get something out of you and they're going to make a palacious argument to do that. And just saying the rate of return on debt is lower than the rate you have to pay to equity holders to entice them to invest, that argument on its own doesn't specify friction and for that reason is not a useful argument to use. Okay, Joel, so I think now it's time to introduce our guest. We're very happy to have as our guest today, Jim Milstein. Jim is the co-chairman of Guggenheim Securities, the investment banking and capital markets business of Guggenheim Partners, a global investment and advisory firm. From 2009 to 2011, Jim was the chief restructuring officer at the U.S. Department of the Treasury when the Obama administration bailed out General Motors. In that role, he was also responsible for oversight and management of the department's largest investments in the financial sector and was the principal architect of AIG's restructuring and recapitalization Prior to joining the Treasury, Jim served as global co-head of corporate restructuring at Lazard from 2000 to 2008. And at Lazard, he represented the United Auto Workers in connection with the restructuring of their contractual relations with GM, Ford, and Chrysler from 2005 to 2007. Jim, welcome to the show. Nice to be here. Thanks for having me. 
So Jim, you spent your whole career dealing with firms in bankruptcy. Let me ask you a question just as a summary of all the bankruptcies you've dealt with. What fraction of the time was the end result liquidation versus a transfer of control? Um, I've probably worked on 400 different restructurings over the course of the last 42 years doing this kind of work. And I would say really only twice over that period has it resulted in a liquidation. You know, the, the Chapter 11 of the United States Bankruptcy Code was really designed to facilitate the reorganization of companies rather than their liquidation. Liquidation values are used legally as a standard by which plans of reorganization are judged, but it is a very rare bankruptcy that ends up liquidated. So Jim, obviously the transfer of control from equity holders to debt holders is not simple and involve costs. What do you think the major costs are and how important are they in the bigger picture of the company as a whole? Well, the, the friction costs of all the professionals involved in a large case those can be quite considerable, but, you know, the bankruptcy courts, the judges themselves have gotten relatively good at policing the running up of unnecessary fees and expenses. But, you know, the truth is that in a large bankruptcy, all of the parties retain specialized advisors. And so you can have a conference call or a court hearing or a negotiation session. And when you look around, there are a hundred people billing their time to a creditor or, in many cases, to the estate itself. And so those friction costs are real. Okay, the costs are substantial in absolute terms, but in relative terms versus the value of the corporation, it's still not more than in the percentage terms, one, two, three, four percent of the value of the corporation, the, all the costs associated with the bankruptcy, or am I wrong about that? You know, it's very hard to give a rule of thumb. There are cases such as the Caesars bankruptcy on which I worked where, you know, the professional fees were running a couple of hundred million dollars a year. But at the end of the day, the estate, the reorganized company was worth $30 billion. So, you know, would you pay $200 million to right size the balance sheet of a company that ultimately was worth $30 billion? Yeah, you would. Would you pay $3 million to right size the balance sheet of a company ultimately worth $50 $50 million, you know, you'd be very careful in supervising the professionals involved in that size of case to keep the fees down. So, Jim, on that note, do you think the bankruptcy process is the most efficient way to handle financial distress? Or do you think there's a lot of room for improvement? Oh, look, there's always room for improvement. I sat on a commission organized by the American Bankruptcy Institute of all the commission to study reform of Chapter 11, and we came up with a probably 400-page tome that had a series of recommendations to improve the process. But when you compare the legal framework for reorganizations applicable in the United States to those available in other jurisdictions, really, Chapter 11 is probably the most efficient reorganization statute in the world. Indeed. You know, over the course of my career, over the last 40 years, all of the uh, so-called developed countries and many of the developing countries have uh, modernized their bankruptcy statutes really after Chapter 11 because it has been such a successful form in which to salvage the valuable bits of an operating business and allow it to reorganize. Could you comment a bit on how you view bailouts? So, for example, the General Motors bankruptcy, I think a lot of academics viewed that as a watershed event in the sense that the government bailed out General Motors. But absent that government support, don't you think the company would have been reorganized anyway? Actually, I think most people who are not bankruptcy professionals don't understand what happened in the GM bankruptcy. The government really behaved like an aggressive activist vulture fund. And it employed tactics very similar to those that the most sophisticated investors in Chapter 11s employ to facilitate the reorganization of the company. Do I think GM would have survived without the government's intervention? Not at that time. It had a severe run on the liquidity available to it, and it would have had to shut down. Now, One of the reasons I think most people don't understand and unfairly criticize the government in its capacity as a dip lender in that proceeding is that the government went 
to the existing secured creditors of GM, the people first in line to receive the value of GM's assets, and said, hey, if you guys want to put up the dip, if you want to finance it in Chapter 11, please go right ahead. And it was only after those creditors who really were entitled to whatever the value of GM was, because it leans on virtually all of its assets, it was only after those creditors declined the offer to provide financing. Now, remember when this all occurred, this was in January of 2009, in the middle, probably the deepest point in the financial crisis. And in the same way that the federal government was a lender of last resort through the Fed, through the FDIC, through the Treasury Department, to the financial industry, the, it turned out that the most sophisticated, you know, distressed and special situation investors who had piled into GM secure debt were unwilling to step up at that moment of crisis and keep GM alive. And so in order to save the jobs, in order to keep the factories running, in order to ensure that the largest domestic automobile manufacturer didn't shut down in the middle of the, the crisis, the government was forced to step in where private investors refused to tread. How do you know those investors weren't even more sophisticated, knowing full well that the Obama administration wasn't going to let GM fail, and so they didn't provide the financing because they anticipated the bailout? Yes, well... The reason academics have swirled around this and tried to comment on it is because those investors made a huge stink when the government, then after becoming the dip lender, sought to get the, the company quickly out of bankruptcy, as many of them would have done in the similar position had they made the dip loan, because a company as complex as GM with international operations I mean, really a very complicated, very hard to run international company in one bankruptcy jurisdiction. So GM's assets were sold as a going concern to a newly formed entity, uh, in effect, created by the government to purchase the assets and roll over its dip loan into equity in the new company. And again, the creditors got the proceeds of that sale, but they weren't happy with the price that was paid. And yet none of them and no one else no other auto company showed up to pay a higher price. So, so just to summarize, so you think that if the bailout hadn't happened, then in fact, General Motors would have been liquidated? I think it would have shut down. And the question is, how expensive would it have been to restart? I mean, this was the analysis that was being done in the Treasury Department at the time. How many other affected businesses would shut down if GM shut down? All of the car dealerships that depended on GM, all of the suppliers that depended on GM, all of the auto body shops that depended on parts from GM suppliers who would have been shut down. I can't remember the name of the consulting firm in Detroit who generally consults for auto companies. The estimate by that firm, whose name I forget at the time, was that had GM shut down 3 million jobs would have also stopped right then and there because of the integrated supplier, dealer, and customer networks that depended on GM's operations. And so from a macroeconomic point of view, I think the government rightly decided that, you know, in the middle of this financial crisis to have the largest American auto manufacturer shut down with all of the attendant job losses in the supplier and dealer networks and service networks would have made a bad situation worse. And that the cost of restarting all of those businesses would have far exceeded any subsidy that the government might otherwise have had to convey to GM as part of this process. I mean, Jim, the only thing I would say is those numbers are ignoring a very important thing, and that is cars need to be sold. I mean, people buy cars. So the numbers assume that GM would shut down and no other car manufacturer would sell those cars, that those cars just would never get sold. And I think that's probably an exaggeration. Oh, no, I concede that Ford and, Chry well, not Chrysler, but Ford and the Japanese and European car manufacturers would have tried to step in. But the loss in productive capacity across the supplier networks. I mean, part of the analysis was 
if you look at the suppliers to GM of a given part, they're also suppliers to Toyota and to Ford and to Hyundai. And so if that supplier shuts down, the contagion effects on all of the other auto industries might be very difficult to contain. So in effect, the so-called bailout of GM was actually a bailout of the supplier network and of all of the other auto companies manufacturing in the United States, because it had the tier one suppliers to GM, who are also suppliers to the rest of the industry, shut down. The rest of the industry would have shut down. So your premise that there might have been someone to step in, theoretically, yeah that GM's market share might have been picked up from someone else unless the GM bankruptcy caused the rest of the supplier base to shut down, which caused the rest of the industry to shut down. So the conclusion was reached that the loss of productive capacity and the contagion effects of a GM shutdown were far greater than any subsidy that the government might have had to convey to get this all done. Well, thank you very much. Thanks so much, Jim. Thanks for having me, guys. You know, Jules, what the discussion really highlighted is just how difficult it is to make decisions in a crisis situation like a GM bankruptcy. You know, Jules, the, uh, there's so many things that could happen and there's so many contingencies. It's a very difficult time for the government to make decisions like this. Yeah, but Jonathan, I also think it's important to not make all else equal mistakes because those types of hypothetical scenarios are particularly privy to making all else equals mistakes, where you just say, if we had done this differently, this would have happened. But we do need to take into account all the other parties that are involved and the other decisions that they would have made had we done something differently. And so that makes these hypothetical scenarios so hard. I agree. It's essential not to make the all else equal mistake in those situations. So next episode, we're going to go back to our usual bi-weekly schedule with a conversation about labor contracts. And we just saw in the discussion about bankruptcy, how important labor contracts can be and how important it is that firms can stick with labor contracts. Thanks for listening to the All Else Equal podcast. Please leave us a review at Apple Podcasts. We love to hear from our listeners and be sure to catch our next episode by subscribing or following our show wherever you listen to your podcasts. For more information and episodes, visit allelseequalpodcast.com or follow us on LinkedIn. The All Else Equal Podcast is a production of Stanford University's Graduate School of Business and is produced by Alumni FM.